All right, hello and good evening, everyone. It's a few minutes past seven o'clock Eastern time. We will be getting started. So thank you all for joining us tonight for our seventh and final Living with Liver Disease session of this year. Uh, my name is Nan Maximovich. I'm the Director of Support and Education here at the Kenny Liver Foundation, and I will be the moderator and host for this session. I would like to start by acknowledging that the Canadian Liver Foundation's national office in Markham, Ontario, is situated upon traditional territories of the Anishinaabe peoples and of the Haudenosaunee peoples. It's covered, over, uh, covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Now, the Canadian Liver Foundation's Living with Liver Disease program has been around for more than 25 years, and it continues to serve as an educational tool for both patients and caregivers, but also as a peer support tool. Uh, this program provides an opportunity to increase community-based learning about liver disease and the importance of liver health in hopes to reduce the incidence and impact of liver disease through prevention, early diagnosis, uh, treatment, and care without geographical barriers. Our speakers included healthcare providers, allied health professionals, subject matter experts, as well as patient advocates. Today's session will address navigating the healthcare system a rather common theme and sometimes a challenge affecting those at risk or living with liver disease along with their caregivers. Uh, we are joined by our two presenters today. We got Elizabeth uh, Lee from the Toronto General Hospital at the University Health Network and Alberta Cross representative uh, Caitlin Turun. We will have both of our speakers complete their talks prior to moving to a question and answer portion. So please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask your questions during the presentation and note that questions will be answered following both speakers' talks. Now, following the Q&A, we will be hosting uh, a brief breakout room session. Uh, this will provide an opportunity for our community members um, across the country who are joining to talk about their journeys openly and safely, uh, share some insights, stories, tips, and even suggestions with others who may be going through the same thing. Uh, so for those of you who may not be familiar with the breakout rooms, it is a feature within the Zoom platform that allows people to be split into smaller groups within the meeting. Uh, for tonight, the groups will be split into two regions. We'll have an Eastern and a Western Canada region, and we suggest joining the group that best fits your geographical location. And of course, if you find yourself not sure which group to join, one of our moderators and staff members will assign you to a group. Uh, these group uh, breakout rooms will likely run for about 10 to 15 minutes um, after the presentation talks and after the Q&A. Uh, so today's session will be recorded and available on the Canadian Liver Foundation's Living with Liver Disease webpage. That's liver.ca slash LWLD, so Living with Liver Disease, an acronym, as well as our YouTube pages and our other social media pages in the coming day. Of course, in respecting our members' privacy, the breakout room sessions uh, will not be recorded. So for those of you who may uh, be new to this program and who have not had a chance to either attend or look at our past sessions and might not be familiar with the CLF, uh, the CLF was established in 1969, uh, so well over 50 years ago, and it was the first organization in the world created to help people with liver disease. Now, we are committed to promoting liver health and improving the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of liver disease through our four core pillars. And you've seen there, research, education, patient support, and advocacy. Now, at this time, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Elizabeth Lee. Uh, Liz is a nurse practitioner at the Toronto Center for Liver Disease at the Toronto General Hospital, a University Health Network, or UHN. Uh, she has worked for over 14 years in various clinical settings in the community and within the UHN, spanning the continuum of chronic liver disease from diagnosis to transplantation. Uh, Liz's main clinical focus is on the management of patients with cirrhosis and alcohol-associated liver disease. Uh, she works on developing or works on developing quality improvement initiatives and research projects aimed at optimizing clinical management in these patient populations. Uh, she maintains a separate practice in managing patients in general hepatology. Uh, Liz has a keen interest in clinical education and fostering the growth of hepatology nurses and is the current president of one of the CLF's partners of the Canadian Association of Hepatology Nurses. She also serves as an adjunct lecturer for the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. Uh, so it is my pleasure to uh, pass the virtual mic over to Liz uh, for her talk on this very important uh, topic on patients and caregivers who are navigating or going through the journey uh, with liver disease. Uh, so Liz, um, over to you. 
All right. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Nem, and also to the Hain Liver Foundation for giving me an opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, your time this evening. So I'm going to share my screen now, um, and then so that way we can uh, then get the presentation started. So, um, and I do have like a co-presenter that's going to be speaking in like the next part. Um, but, you know, like, so I, I will be speaking um, for some of the first objectives, and this is really about living with chronic liver disease. And then so um, I will speak about a couple of different things. Um, so these are a couple of my disclosures. Um, so as Nem has already highlighted, I am affiliated with um, CON as well as Canadian Association for Study of Liver. Um, I don't have any specific disclosures, um, and I will not be talking about any products in today's uh, presentation. Um, and then so, and I think Dan has also given some background in terms of my clinical practice. And I think a lot of the work that I do do and what I'm really passionate about is really, um, aside from the work that I do, is also about the collaboration with the lab community providers and partners and with patients and support persons, um, because that is really what grounds us in the work that we do. And so what we will talk about over like the next 30 minutes is really talk about, um, you know, some of the key objectives that we had talked about beforehand with them. And my understanding is that um, it may be good to talk about some brief summaries of, of various chronic liver diseases. So I will touch upon a few and that includes um, chronic hepatitis B, C, fatty liver disease and alcohol associated liver disease. Um, and then we will talk about strategizing um, your and maximizing your in-person and virtual appointments with your liver provider or providers. Uh, have a brief talk about like a broad overview of a clinical care plan uh, and with appreciation that there could be potential differences. And, um, and then I will then pass over the mic to my co-presenter who will give a, a health insurance overview. Um, so I think when we talk about chronic liver disease and the reason why I talk about it being chronic and the context of today's presentation is that we're talking about liver disease that lasts more than six months. And so, we, we, as I had mentioned before, we're going to be talking about common things today. So, viral hepatitis, fatty liver disease, alcohol associated liver disease, which is a, a subset of fatty liver disease. And these are all things because of chronicity could lead to complications such as cirrhosis, um, and as well as the development of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a risk factor uh, in which cirrhosis is an independent risk, risk factor for developing HCV. All right, so we're going to first talk about viral hepatitis B, so hepatitis B and C. And so just briefly in talking about the, these two, so hepatitis B is transmitted by bodily fluid. Um, it's most commonly uh, via sexual transmission. It's also, and for a lot of individuals um, that do develop chronic infection, it is actually transmitted vertically. And so, and this is a so chronic infection often um, and most commonly is um, in infants that are infected from hepatitis B infected mothers and typically develop chronic infection before the age of five. Um, with hepatitis C, it is a bloodborne virus. The way that uh, the hepatitis C virus is transmitted is blood to blood. Um, vertical transmission is less common uh, as well as sexual transmission, although the uh, anal receptive sex is a uh, risk factor that could increase the risk of hepatitis C transmission, especially with the breakage of skin that could promote blood to blood transmission. In terms of hepatitis B, just like a really brief whirlwind for those like that have wanted a little bit more context, like so hepatitis B is actually very common globally. Um, you know, it affects more than 3.5% of the population. So most of the individuals that do have chronic hepatitis B are those that are born in the pre-vaccine era. So, and what I mean by this is that um, hepatitis B vaccines were not actually introduced as part of standard in terms of vaccinating um, children at the time that they were born to hepatitis B positive mothers. So that's a practice that did not start in the 1980s in some countries. And in some countries, it did not actually become standard in the early 2000s. So you can imagine that given that most infections are acquired before the age of five, that the burden of chronic hepatitis B infection still exists. And, and, uh, and so there is a lot of efforts made by World Health Organization to help with decreasing incidence of hepatitis B 
infection before the age of five. So in the current moment, in the present day, the really high rates of incidence of new infections are in Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, Western Pacific. Um, but, you know, given that, like, we do live in Canada, and given that we are, like, really a, a country that is made up of, um, it's really a global country, we do have to see a lot of chronic hepatitis B, and particularly in very metropolitan areas. Um, in Canada, you know, so um, that does affect about, like, 1% of po the population. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, like, with a uh, uh, like about 70% of the people that we do see with chronic hepatitis B in Canada are from immigrant regions of high intensity. Um, and so, and but there are certain vulnerable populations that are disproportionately affected, um, but generally more involved related to acute hepatitis B. And that includes people, uh, men who have sex with men, um, you know, street involved youth, um, current or previous uh, incarceration. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, just briefly, so hepatitis B, it is preventable by completing the hepatitis B vaccine series. So if you um, never been vaccinated for hepatitis B, it is completely preventable and uh, definitely would encourage being vaccinated, especially if there are possible risk factors. Um, and in terms of um, screening for a pregnant woman, um, you know, that is actually something that's becoming a little bit more standard. Uh, because of the fact that there could be antiviral therapy that could be introduced in the third trimester in order to reduce the viral load, in order to reduce the likelihood of acquiring hepatitis B at the time of birth. And there's also, because even with um, immunizations at the time of birth, there is possible risk of vaccine failure for those with high viral loads at giving birth. So they, they're, that's why they do want to screen pregnant women for hepatitis B at that time. Moment for hepatitis B, um, there are no curative therapies. Um, there is antiviral therapy, so oral pills that are daily that are meant to stop viral replication. And typically, this is a lifelong therapy for those that do require treatment. And the idea behind these therapies by stopping viral replication is that by stopping the mechanism for viral replication, it could stop liver damage and um, prevent further disease progression. But there is actually no formal cure at this moment, but there are a lot of uh, clinical trials that are targeting different aspects of the virus that are happening and they are currently in progress right now. Um, and including in our centers, a lot of our centers are actually involved in clinical trials. Um, hepatitis B is an independent risk factor for um, hepatocellular carcinoma, so HCV, which is liver cancer. So men over the age of 40, women over the age of 50, um, people with a family history of HCC, as well as those, as I mentioned before, with cirrhosis, because cirrhosis is also an independent risk factor for a liver cancer. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears over to hepatitis C. So hepatitis C, it affects about 1% of the world population with highest rates of incidence and prevalence in uh, European and Eastern Mediterranean country, uh, in regions. Um, so the proportion of uh, the population living with hepatitis C infection, it in increases with the cohort, uh, age cohort effect. Um, so, and previously was related to unsafe healthcare practices. So, um, you know, in different countries, uh, there was a possible reuse of needles. And so people actually had gotten affected with hepatitis C unknowingly. Um, and so, there uh, and in current day, um, a lot of injection uh, new infections are related to injection drug use, and that does account for a substantial proportion of new infections. So in Canada, it has been estimated that it's about 0.7 percent of the total Canadian population, with the most prevalent group um, being still born between 1935 to 1975. But for that reason, um, in but that is actually the reason why there has been recommendations to the hepatitis C guidelines um, that were published uh, not too long ago that do recommend, recommend like a one-time screening for hepatitis C if you were born between 1935 to 1975, as well as individuals who that do fall into high-risk groups for acquiring hepatitis C infection. So high-risk groups do include uh, people who inject drugs uh, or people who formerly have injected drugs involved youth and people experiencing homelessness. So 
hepatitis C, unlike hepatitis B, um, you know, there are some differences. So with hepatitis C, there is actually no vaccine that is available. Um, at this current moment, there is also not universal screening for pregnant women for hepatitis C. Um, there is some interest in uh, looking into this, and um, there is also increased conversation in setting the safety profile of some of the antiviral therapies um, um, that they are actually being studied because uh, there is a growing population of pregnant hepatitis C women um, that uh, have hepatitis C infection, and that could be the opportunity where they're most engaged in healthcare and and for that reason, there is some interest in looking at the safety profile. But at this current moment, it is still being studied and it's not formally in practice at this time. So hepatitis C, unlike hepatitis B, there are actually curative uh, treatments that are available in either an eight week or a 12 week oral regimen uh, with 95% plus cure rates, uh, which is pretty phenomenal given even what it was in terms of for hepatitis C treatment many years, um, maybe as recent as like about seven years ago. Um, and so those that do remain at risk for HCC after cure are people who are at risk, um, you know, for having uh, the people that do have cirrhosis. So I wanted to drill that home as an independent risk factor for liver cancer. So background of cirrhosis or comorbid liver disease. So if you have more than one liver disease, um, you know, that could possibly still drive your risk for um, liver disease progression, even after getting rid of the hepatitis C. So things like fatty liver, you know, either from Apple B. Nash or alcohol-associated liver disease, um, or another type of viral hepatitis also as well. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to switch gears now. I'm going to talk a little bit about fatty liver as a whole. So and um, this is uh, both what we call non-alcohol associated uh, fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, so NAFLB or NASH. So those are the two different acronyms we're going to use or alcohol-associated liver disease. Um, but in reality, there is actually some talk about, you know, merging the nomenclature like a little bit because it does fall under the umbrella of fatty liver altogether. Um, but it is good to talk about some of the differences for the context of today's um, presentation. All right, so the reason why we want to talk a little bit more about fatty liver now is, you know, like I, I think just to speak a little bit just very specifically about the local experience and why do we care is that for a lot of the people that we do see now um, that are presenting with liver failure, like some of the biggest reasons why people are presenting to the hospital with liver failure are related to alcohol. And that's over 50% of the people that we do see as well as um, NAFLD or NASH. Um, we also do see people with ongoing risk factors after hepatitis C treatment. So as I alluded to, if people have comorbid disease, so NAFLD and NASH or alcohol-associated liver disease or ALD. And the reason why we care is because when people present with liver failure, the risk for being readmitted within the three days is pretty high, it's 30%. So one in three people could get readmitted. So um, you know, like, so for us, a lot of us like do really care about being able to identify it, you know, further upstream in order to prevent downstream com consequences, because by, by and large, like I would say statistically, these are definitely the biggest reasons why we are seeing um, people requiring liver transplantation, um, either because they have liver failure or because they have cirrhosis and develop liver cancer, which is also a reason for liver transplantation as well. And so, and the reason why, and some of the reasons why fatty liver has become uh, uh, like a bigger deal is because, you know, at, we know from like looking at across Canada, like, you know, obesity is a bit of an epidemic and, you know, obesity itself is an independent risk factor for developing metabolic syndrome. So, you know, people do develop a diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, you know, and so in anyone with like these metabolic risk factors, like with metabolic disease are also at risk for developing fatty or, or um, like at risk for developing liver manifestations of, um, of fatty, uh, like liver manifestations, so liver disease. 
And so, and there has been some discussion around actually renaming this to metabolic associated liver. But that is in reality what it is. Um, that's not like the, there's a lot of back and forth around the nomenclature around fatty liver. So I think in terms of the blanket statement of how we talk about fatty liver, still like that, that is how we talk about in this particular context. But keeping in mind, these are the people that we would think about that are at high risk for developing fatty liver disease. And then so in terms of like fatty liver disease, it, it is a bit of a spectrum. So, I mean, for contacts, like a lot of people that do have a fatty liver. So, you know, so keeping in mind that like when you do see fatty liver on ultrasound, this is what we call cystal steatosis. And that can occur in about 10 to 15% of people that have a normal BMI, so body uh, mass index. Um, so under uh, so under 25. But there are also like uh, for people who are considered obese, so with like a BMI of over 30, um, that could be upwards of about 70 to 80 percent of people. And from that subset, that population, you know, like so just to keep in mind, like not everyone develops cirrhosis, right? Like so, but you you can also see that as the percentages go down in terms of the the uh, proportion of people that actually go on to develop cirrhosis. But going back to the last slide where we do see the percentage of people that are at risk for fatty liver disease, that volume itself is very high. And I think that's like the context to take away from it. So not everyone with fatty liver and ultrasound is going to develop cirrhosis, but because there are so many people that are at risk for fatty liver disease, the volume of fatty liver disease is actually very high. And that's the what I want to take away from those two slides I just presented. In terms of the treatment for fatty liver at this current moment, and I'm sure you've heard this before if you've had interaction with your liver provider, is that you do come out thinking, wow, you know, that that's it. Like it is so, but in reality, this is really what is considered the gold standard and what is actually considered to be most proven and most effective in reducing liver disease progression for fatty liver. So it is really about diet. Um, you know, so if that could involve like some degree of calorie restriction, um, really avoiding toast containing food and drinks. So avoiding uh, juices, like fruit juices, pop, you know, so um, starches, like the, these are things that like um, a lot of people don't realize that they're intaking that could have significant effect on their fatty liver disease. Also choosing healthier methods for food preparation is also a big deal. Um, in terms of exercise, like, so we do recommend about 150 to 200 minutes uh, per week of moderate intensity exercise, um, so getting the heart rate up, um, and as well as resistance training. And these are things that could together combine, could, it could lead to, you know, hopefully what is considered like um, reduction of body weight, um, because what has been shown and proven is that by being able to lose between 7 to 10% of your total body weight, could actually reduce the degree of steatosis, so fat on the liver, as well as reduce the degree of fibrosis, so scarring of the liver as well. In terms of treatment for fatty liver disease, so, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, are there any medications and progress? Well, there is a lot of trials that are in progress, um, and specifically targeting mechanisms for metabolic disease and weight loss. And, um, you may have heard of some things out there, you know, that have already been marketed for weight loss specifically. Those are actually also medications that are being looked at fatty liver, um, but there isn't like a formal indication for fatty liver right now uh, in terms of the way it's being described, but it is actually pretty close to possibly coming into, um, into market in the future. Um, you know, so, but in the meantime, I think the main things to take away are what I had talked about as a gold standard, also, the other thing to really emphasize is really about treating and optimizing your metabolic disease. So if you have really poorly controlled diabetes, this is the time to take control. It is actually really important to be able to manage your metabolic risk factors because that could be a driver in terms of disease progression for fatty liver. We do not recommend any herbal supplements in general. Um, typically, there's not really any proven benefit. In fact, some supplements have actually caused some of our patients to run into trouble because 
they get metabolites to the liver and can actually cause liver related injury from, um, from the supplement. So no supplement is actually truly benign. Um, there is some evidence that has talked about in terms of black filtered coffee, though, ironically, as like a, an, a supplement, having said that. So, uh, and uh, so we do talk about like coffee as something that could be taken for those that are able to drink coffee. So two cups daily, uh, avoiding adding sugar, like, you, you know, like um, if you are having a, like a, you know, a double double or a four by four, I've even heard some patients say, you know, that will probably reduce the effect of the coffee uh, and related to, you know, its effects on the liver health. And again, uh, for those that have um, advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, these would be individuals that we would consider liver cancer screening also as well. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about the other entity of thigh liver, which is alcohol associated liver disease. And, you know, like alcohol is a pretty commonly used substance globally. Um, you know, it, it is considered a bit of a global pandemic. Um, you know, for men, it is, and I guess, when I'm talking about these particular statistics, it does not only encompass uh, alcohol-associated liver disease, but it's also talking about alcohol and other complications also as well. So for men, it's about 6.6% of deaths, and for women, it's about 2.2% of deaths. In Canada, um, it's been known that, like, you know, for alcohol, like, for it being commonly used, that's pretty probably about 78%, so about four out of, four out of five uh, people of Canadians will report having um, used alcohol over the last year, and about one in five individuals are actually probably at risk of chronic and immediate alcohol-related harms, respectively. Um, so that's actually a significant group, and during the pandemic, we definitely had seen an uptick and rise um, in hospitalizations related to alcohol-related liver injury. Um, there also has been a retrospective population-based study that's been done um, in Ontario, but I think could be translated broadly in Canada, is that there is a rising incidence of cirrhosis in patients born in 1980, 1990, so in much younger patients, and particularly the incidence of cirrhosis in younger women versus younger men. And so um, I wanted to put this out there because, you know, when we do come into clinic and when we do see a lot of our patients, you know, we need to talk about a standard definition of what a drink actually really means. So, you know, our, our patient could be talking about two drinks, but it could be two, uh, but th those two drinks in their minds is actually not what we're defining as a drink. So if it's beer, we're all not talking about a tall boy, but we're talking about a small can or a small bottle. So a 341 milliliter um, uh, of 5% alcohol, um, a cider cooler about the same amount, if it's wine, it's a five ounce glass, not a wine, nine ounce glass. And if we're talking about distilled alcohol, so it would be like 1.5 ounces uh, would be considered a uh, one standard drink. So in the, these were taken from the low risk drinking guidelines that are currently on the center, uh, Canadian Center of Substance Use and Addiction, so CCSA. So that's currently um, what they have on, on the website. And like it's 10 drinks a week for women, 10, uh, 15 drinks a week for men, um, but that actually is changing and it's actually going to be changing in January of next year. And what it's actually going to be reduced to, and we've had an opportunity to take a look at some of this guidance that, um, that they're going to be putting out beforehand and what they're actually moving the recommendation to is no more than two standard drinks a week and that with no gender differences. So there are no longer will be gender differences as part of the recommendation, and all about um, you know how you use alcohol and how it may affect things along the continuum of risk. So low risk drinking is identified as no more than two standard drinks per week. Um, so I think really briefly, you know, when we talk about alcohol associated liver disease, so people who use alcohol, about ninety percent of them will develop fatty liver. So that's like about 90% of them. So not everyone develops liver disease from alcohol. We don't understand why. And so 
there, and this is something that we hear a lot in with our patients, you know, they'll come in, they'll say, my buddy drinks way more than me, but he doesn't have the problems I do. Uh, it's like, I don't understand it. And to be honest with you, I think we're still trying to understand why that is for a lot of individuals that do get affected with liver disease as a result of their alcohol use. So I think it's very standard for us as providers to communicate to our patients that, you know, like we, we don't understand why, but I think what is very clear is that the amount of alcohol that you're using is too much for you. Um, because, and, for the, and when I say you, it's about these and this group of patients. Like, so people that do go on to developing seattle hepatitis, so inflammation um, of fat within the liver, um, you know, about uh, like those individuals that do develop ASH, so alcohol uh, associated steatohepatitis, hepatitis, about more than 75% of them will develop cirrhosis or some degree of fibrosis. And like a significant proportion of them will go on to developing some degree of liver failure. So for the individuals that are susceptible, their risk for developing significant liver disease is very high. In terms of treatment for alcohol associated liver disease, like so in terms of the way we talk about it as liver providers, I think it's very difficult to talk about things other than an end goal of abstinence. But I think that we try to balance that with the individual that we do see in front of us. So we do talk about it in terms of an approach of harm reduction. Um, but, you know, like we do talk about then trying to shift that towards an end goal of abstinence, knowing that, you know, we need to understand the liver related harm to the individual. For a lot of the individuals that we do see, um, you know, like when people do present with substance use, it's also about addressing and assessing for concurrent mental health disorders because a lot of them have underdiagnosed um, or untreated mental health disorders that uh, potentially could be the underlying root cause for a lot of the substance use. Um, we do recommend individual group psychotherapy, substance uh, uh, support groups for alcohol, um, a rapid access addiction medicine clinics or RAM clinics could be something that you may have heard about, um, but these are things that could be recommended also as well. Um, Anti-craving medications um, are also things that could be used and many are actually safe from the liver perspective. So for, as a liver provider, I think that is really important that we do use language and do connect with the, our substance use specialist in order to really make that linkage and collaborate so that way we can best serve our patients. And I think treating concurrent mental health disorders is a really important part of it as well. And again, those with cirrhosis are at risk for liver cancer and also require liver cancer screening. Okay, so just briefly talking about cirrhosis itself. So, um, you know, so I had wanted to make it clear because like, and a lot of patients do come in, they think about cirrhosis being a disease. So cirrhosis is not itself a type of liver disease, but it is the end stage of significant injury to the liver over time as a result of chronic liver injury. And because what you can see from like these slides here, as we move through F1, F2, F3, F4, these are all degrees of scarring to the liver with F4 being the most severe and F1 being mild fibrosis. And you may have heard these terms with your liver providers because like what you can see is that this liver injury that happens over time, it causes scar tissue, it causes this organized matrix in the liver, to, uh, the, the liver cells to break down. And what ends up being, re being replaced by is really fibrous tissue that can form nodules. And that's why the liver looks so bumpy on imaging. Um, if you've ever Googled uh, an image of a liver that's scarred um, and the architecture of the liver then becomes very disorganized and distorted. And that is actually what leads to the development of something called portal hypertension, which are the signs and symptoms that we commonly then associated with some degree of liver failure. Okay. so. Complications of cirrhosis, uh, as I've already alluded to. So there are a couple of different complications that are on the spectrum of people with liver failure. So variceal bleeding, um, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy. We're not going to talk too much about these um, today um, because that itself could be like a pretty big um, presentation in itself. Um, but just to highlight, these are some of the complications. 
The other complication, and which is like a, again, supposed to be an independent risk factor for, is liver cancer. Um, and so, just now, just to talk a little bit about liver cancer itself. So, um, we talk so much about this and we talk about screening, but what does that really mean? So, we do try to drill home like the importance of ongoing regular bands. Um, so, you know, and that's typically every six months. Um, and plus or minus the use of blood work, um, with like this liver cancer marker called alpha beta protein. Um, and so what happens is that when they do pick up nodules, like the idea of liver cancer strands is trying to pick up nodules early. So that way we can intervene early and catch liver cancer. Early. So that's the idea of it. When we do see new growth, some of the recommendations that do happen then are that we might then recommend um, shorter interval ultrasound, so even shorter than six months, so at maybe a three month mark, to look to see if there's any growth in between or if we could, you know, because sometimes we pick up something, but it might just be a regenerative nodule and that'd be a little bit different. But if there is something suspicious or if it continues to grow, we might then talk about something called cross-sectional imaging. So, and that is something like a CT, an MRI, um, or it could be a special type of ultrasound called in contrast enhanced ultrasound that can be done to further characterize the nodule. And um, the imaging features of liver cancer are actually pretty distinct. So we don't necessarily always need a biopsy in order to confirm the diagnosis of liver cancer. But if there is anything that's indeterminate but suspicious, that's when there might be some recommendations to do a biopsy. In terms of the treatment for liver cancer, you know, just some um, in it, because for people that are maybe in the space and want to know how liver cancer therapies may be considered, there are a couple of different factors that do come into mind of a provider when they're thinking about um, possible treatments. So first is what is their underlying liver disease? And so is it reversible? Is it treatable? Um, you know, how sick is their liver? So that's the liver synthetic function and whether or not they've had a history or current signs of liver failure. So the things I've talked about, ascites, or seal bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy. So these things all play into a factor in terms of thinking about whether someone is eligible for liver cancer treatment. The other things that are also considered are their functional status. So how well they're able to function uh, because, uh, and that's used as something like an ECOG performance data skill. And that's what you use to think about and factor into whether liver cancer therapies are available to the individual or not. Finally, is really about the extent of the liver cancer itself. So it could be the size of tumor or tumors, um, the total tumor burden or total, total tumor, uh, tumor volume, um, whether or not the tumor has actually invaded into the vessels, um, the their ASC levels, so those liver cancer marker levels. The one thing I did not add over here is whether or not there's extra hepatic spread, so liver cancer that's spread beyond the liver. So these are all things that are considered factors for potential treatments for liver cancer. So, um, so I know I've given a little bit of a whirlwind, and I, I know I'm being mindful of time, but this is going to be a very brief section on how then you would maximize and create a checklist for your appointment. So. Really, you know, um, in the, we see this happening a lot with like a lot of our patients that are coming in for their appointments. And, um, you know, I, I would say, how do you maximize the appointment? I, I think, it, so, you know, and this is how you might prepare. So I, I do recommend this is like bringing in all of your medication. Like people have a medication list, but ironically, pill bottles are actually probably preferred. It is actually really amazing the amount of times that someone is not actually taking the, the way it is actually indicated on the label. So it's actually, as a provider, it's actually very helpful to have my patient provide a bit of a play-by-play -play of how they take their medications, because that gives you an idea of, are they taking them properly? Are they taking them as prescribed? Um, you know, And that gives you a little bit more of a sense of how you might be able, to, as a provider, be able to adjust your medications. Um, you know, vitamins and supplements are things that people don't, don't think about bringing in, but are actually important, as I had mentioned, because these things can also cause liver-related harms. Bring in the names of all of your specialists, um, your primary care provider, emergency contacts, are all very helpful because 
and update them so that way when we try to again communicate our notes, they go to all of your, the providers that are involved. And, and we like to make sure that we have emergency contacts also available in the case that we can't get in touch with you. Um, you know, like we do like to kind of have an understanding of what you understand about your condition, um, because that gives us a bit of a better starting point of where we would start the conversation from. Um, and so that we're not repeating things and that way we can actually get to what you want to know and that way we can really get to your questions. And, and if you do have a people support people or a, a support person, um, it's also good to bring them in because it's good to reiterate the message, not just with you, but also the, with the people that care about you um, because having more ears than one is actually pretty helpful. In terms of planning a next visit, like so, and this is part of that care plan is really, you know, it's good. So we've talked a lot about and given a bit of a whirlwind of the brief overview, what you would anticipate based on your disease, your liver disease. Um, and so, you know, when we then put that into context of the next visit, it's good to then go away from your visit with the, the following things. So things you would do before your next appointment. So, you know, so that way, come to a common ground, make sure your providers know, make sure you know, um, make sure that we've like written all your prescriptions and we've also done your refills. Um, so that way you don't run out of medications that you need for your treatment. Um, it's good to also highlight the red flag signs and when to go to emergency. So, um, and that's like actually pretty helpful to know. So you know what's an emergency or what to wait and when to call. And finally, making sure that you leave with the contact information of your specialist providers um, so that way you know how to get in touch with us. And so these are such just some practical tips like based on my interactions with my patients and providers that have helped with like preparing our patients a little bit better um, for their next visit that we try to, you know, continue to go along with the care plan as well. And so, and with that, I'm gonna stop my section. I do apologize if I've gone a little bit over time, but hopefully it's been some decent to tell you. I'll take questions at the end. I'll stop the share. I don't know how to stop the share. Okay, yes, okay, all right. Great, thank you, Liz, for that, that, that great overview. It's always good to get a, a fresh overview of, of some of the common liver diseases, especially some of the, chron uh, the chronic ones. It gives us a bit of a, an insight and context into what we're uh, trying to kind of deliver a message to. So um, we're going to have some questions that we've had over the last few weeks that people have sent in uh, via our social channels that we can discuss in the um, following Caitlin's talk. Uh, so I'll move it uh, to the next speaker uh, now. So uh, we have Caitlin Troon come in. Uh, she is um, here from Alberta, from the Alberta Cross, um, uh, rep rep sorry, representative from the Alberta Cross. Alberta Blue Cross. Uh, she's been with the uh, organization for four years now, and she has a background in kinesiology with a uh, concentration in physical activity and health. And uh, Caitlin's here today to give us a uh, an overview of the kind of health insurance plan. Um, she will kind of provide a uh, a bit of an Alberta focus uh, just as, as where she's uh, currently located, uh, but she'll definitely try to incorporate some uh, national perspective for those listeners and viewers who are not based uh, in the Alberta section. Uh, so, Caitlin, I will uh, pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks, Liz, for that really awesome overview, some really great information, including um, now I have information about the effects of black filtered coffee um, on your liver. So, um, like Nam mentioned, my name is Caitlin and I come from Alberta Blue Cross, um, specifically from the individual products area. So a lot of um, what I have information and expertise on is on the individual uh, personal health benefit plans that we have here in Alberta. But the goal for today is to really give you an overview of things to think about, key considerations um, when you're looking into what health benefit plan is going to take you through each stage of your life. So on the agenda for today, um, we're gonna take a look at government sponsored programs, take a look at what might be available through each of the provincial governments, and then see how a personal benefit plan can help supplement what's already available. So we'll go ahead and get started. 
starting with those government sponsored programs. So I'm sure many of you are familiar that we do have universal coverage here in Canada. However, what this means is that the provincial and territorial governments are actually responsible for delivering health services. So each province and territory is then responsible of providing that access to any of the necessary hospital and doctor services. So for example, here in Alberta, um, our Alberta Healthcare Insurance Plan, uh, which would probably be similar across each of the provinces and territories would cover things like physician visits, hospital procedures and even uh, your stay at the, at the hospital, your hospital accommodation. So a misconception can be that things like prescription drugs would be covered under your provincial health care, which it is not. Um, there may be other provincial and territorial government sponsored programs that may be available. So I do recommend um, connecting with each of your provincial and territorial um, governments um, in regards to finding what exactly is covered and what other programs might be available to you. Um, so as Nam mentioned, um, I'm going to take a Alberta uh, approach. So here's an example of what it might look like um, here in Alberta. So again, like I mentioned, we do have that Alberta health care insurance plan and each province is going to have their provincial health care insurance plan. And again, for Alberta, that's available to all of our residents here in the province. And there's no cost associated with that. So all those necessary services, necessary medical services, whether it's the physician visits or your stay in the hospital, that would be covered under this umbrella. Now, we do have some other government-sponsored programs or government-subsidized programs here in Alberta, and there may be similar ones also across each of the provinces or territories, but I'll give you a couple of examples of what we have here in our province. So that middle one is a subsidized plan called the non-group plan, and this particular one will be for individuals under the age of 65 and this particular government sponsored program would cover things like um, prescription drugs or ambulance, um, diabetic supplies for insulin treated diabetics and psychological services. So that's something that's available for individuals um, with a premium um, associated with that. Here in Alberta, and there again, there may be similar um, programs across each of the provinces. Once you turn 65, you gain access to something called the Coverage for Seniors Plan. And our Coverage for Seniors Plan here in Alberta um, is for individuals 65 years of age and over. And what's covered under the Coverage for Seniors Plan would be things like their prescription drugs, um, ambulance coverage, their psychological and chiropractic services, as well as diabetic supplies for insulin treated diabetics. So these are examples of the types of things that are covered under the provincial health care and then on covered under the other government subsidized or government sponsored programs. Now, for some individuals, um, they're looking for more types of coverage, whether that's more prescription coverage or coverage for things like dental and vision um, that may extend to their family members too. And so that's when we start speaking to the personal health insurance or personal benefit plan that will be available through um, each Blue Cross. And so we'll get right into that also. So I'd like to just provide some key considerations, um, things to think about as an individual may be looking for a personal um, benefit plan. So for individuals who may not be covered um, through um, a work plan or a work sponsored benefit plan, for example, this is when they would be interested or look for um, a personal benefit plan that would help supplement what's already available through the government. So the first consideration I would suggest is looking into any eligibility criteria for a personal benefit plan. So for example, is this a guaranteed issued plan or a medical re medically reviewed plan? So guaranteed issued plans um, would mean that individuals can apply and directly enroll onto this benefit plan um, versus a medically reviewed plan where an individual would, would then have to answer medical questions um, about their medical history. And as a result, 
certain types of things may not be covered based on that. So for individuals, you may want to be looking into guaranteed issued plans. There may also be uh, personal benefit plans that have certain deadlines or other eligibility criteria like age, for example, and we'll get into some examples that we have here at Alberta Blue Cross. The next would be benefit needs. So what types of benefits is the individual looking for outside of what's available through the government, for example? So if somebody has certain prescriptions that they'd like to be covered, this may be a great way to get those covered through a personal benefit plan. You may also have other things that individuals may be looking for, like psychology coverage or maybe other paramedicals like massage therapy. Those types of benefits would then be covered under a personal um, health plan. And what I like to do is I ask individuals that are interested in getting a personal benefit plan is do an inventory of what types of benefits are going to be important to you. And for example, if prescription drugs are going to be an important component, certainly take a look at that portion of the plan. Also take a look if your prescription drugs are covered under the plan. And the way you do that is by providing your drug identification number that would be listed on your prescription and taking a look to see if that particular one would be covered. Uh, the next is travel coverage. So I know um, individuals are traveling more often. And if you are traveling, keep in mind that travel coverage actually does kick in. Um, as soon as you leave your province of residence. So um, this is something that I always point out also is that in the travel coverage component of a lot of these personal benefit plans, there is an industry standard 90 day stability clause. So make sure you take a look at that. And what this 90 day stability clause means is that if you do have a health condition, um, it needs to be stable for 90 days for it to be covered while you're away. So stability may be different for each of the benefit plans, but certainly take a look at what this means for each of the benefit plans that you're looking into. Here at Alberta Blue Cross, this means stability means that um, you don't have any impeding tests upcoming within the 90 days. It means you haven't had a change in your prescription. So certainly take a look into that for sure if you're planning on leaving the province. The next would be resources. So um, certainly personal benefit plans can be complicated. So what we suggest is certainly reaching out to your Blue Cross benefit specialist. And there are Blue Crosses across the country, whether it's Pacific Blue Cross um, in the West or Alberta Blue Cross here in Alberta, all the way to Medivy Blue Cross in the East. Each of those Blue Crosses will be able to connect with you and help you navigate uh, the benefit plans that are available and guide you to the best benefit plan that's the right fit for you. In addition, they'll be able to answer any questions that you have um, in regards to what you're looking for in a personal benefit plan and hopefully um, break things down um, to make things easier to understand. Additionally, um, there are some online resources, including the ones on our Alberta Blue Cross website um, to help guide you and show you what might be covered under each of our personal benefit plans um, and show you what the eligibility criteria might be also. The last consideration that I have on here is cost. Cost is always a big thing for sure and something to keep in mind. Different benefit plans will have a different cost um, for us here at Alberta Blue Cross. The cost will be based on the level of coverage and your age. So certainly take a look at that. The more coverage, the more increased cost, depending on your age and what's available through your provincial government that may have a, an effect on your personal benefits also. And so with that, I wanna take all these considerations and show you an example of what that might look like um, as you research a plan or try to find a plan that's a best fit for you. So here at Alberta Blue Cross, um, as an example, we have three different plans. Um, they're called the Blue Choice, Blue Shirt, and Retiree Plan. 
The Blue Choice Plan is for individuals 64 and under, so again, that eligibility criteria based on age, and is a medically reviewed plan. So again, to get onto this plan, you would have to answer some medical questions, provide your medical history information on that. So certainly um, make sure you take a look of, of whether or not that is a um, eligibility criteria for a personal benefit plan that you may be interested in. The other two, Blue Assured and Retiree, are guaranteed issued plans. So something that may be a better fit for individuals um, with liver disease as you are able to get enrolled on the plan right away um, and not have to answer any medical questions. Specifically in Alberta, our Blue Assured plan is for all ages and our retiree plan has another eligibility criteria of age being 50 to 75. And then also there's um, a time frame um, eligibility. So you must apply within 60 days of leaving uh, an employer sponsored plan behind. So again, examples of different eligibility criteria you need to be aware of um, as you look into which one might be the best fit for you. So here's a breakdown of what a personal benefit plan may cover or include um, to help supplement what's already available through the government. So um, an example of our retiree plan, you'll see that there's a prescription drug maximum of up to $3,000, dental coverage up to $2,000, and extended health benefits up to $7,500. So that would include things like uh, your paramedicals, like physiotherapy, psychological coverage, all of that. In this one particularly, we have travel coverage also. So you can kind of see a breakdown of what would be covered in a personal benefit plan. And for this retiree plan specifically, you can compare it to what might be covered on one of our other plans called Blue Assured. So this one has prescription drug maximum of up to 1500 dental at 1500 extended health benefits up to 5000 and then travel coverage um, again also included. So you can see between those two particular plans that the maximums are a little bit different. So depending on what your needs may be when you do your inventory, that will affect which one would be the best fit for you. And then again, um, those maximums of coverage um, will have an effect on the price. So uh, when you took a look at that retiree plan, the maximums were a little bit higher than what's offered on this Blue Assured plan. And as a result, that retiree plan is going to have a little bit of a higher premium. So that would also help in that budgeting key consideration when you're um, taking a look to see which one you may want to uptake in the future. So with that, um, I know that this is really it was all Alberta focused, um, but with that being said, there certainly are different personal benefit plans available through each Blue Cross and all the provinces and territories um, available to you and some things that are very similar to what we offer here in Alberta. So certainly reach out to each of your Blue Crosses for more information um, and certainly they'll be able to assist you with um, each of the provinces that you reside. And so with that, that's what I had um, for today. So I hope you guys found that informative. Um, and I guess um, it's time for that question, question period of today's session. Perfect, thank you Caitlin, for that. Very informative. I find people tend to forget every now and then what uh, some of the general uh, coverage or benefits is available really through, uh, whether it's through government or other, or other services, that's very helpful. Um, we did have a few questions. Actually, both of you have answered them quite well um, during your talk. Some of the questions that we popped up um, originally, I suppose one of the more common ones with respect to uh, coverage was services like dietary services, seeing a registered dietitian and social workers or even mental health services like addiction services that Liz was talking about. Um, so maybe perhaps Liz, you can maybe mention how maybe roughly how that would work from perhaps your perspective, if you who do have a, a patient or a caregiver who was inquiring about those services or, or services that you would recommend, um, how would that go about with respect to referrals and if there is an additional cost? And then maybe Caitlin, you can provide any insight from your end, um, how that will work on, 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 on your perspective. Yeah, um, th thanks for that question. Um, you know, like, uh, I, I think that is actually something like, 
I think even as liver providers, I must say that we do um, struggle with because like, sadly, a lot of our liver providers, like we talk so much about um, the multifaceted parts of liver care, but a lot of our liver clinics themselves don't necessarily have liver, a multidisciplinary team. That's perhaps like a part of it. So, um, you know, it's like, so we do talk a lot about like some services, some of it is like online and it might be province specific. Um, like, so I know that in Ontario, there is like access to um, some like provincial um, supports um, where you could actually get like a dietary consult or the local LIN. So like in Ontario, there's like a, um, you know, within our regional authorities, um, there are actually referrals for publicly funded services, like for a dietitian or a social worker, like a caseworker. So these things do exist and we try to facilitate some of these referrals. Um, you know, ideally it'd be nice if it was part of our clinic, but like, you know, but because it isn't like we do rely a lot on external referral, um, but there is also, um, you know, if someone also has like, metabolic disease, for example, like in, if they are connected to their endocrinology clinics, it actually might be also helpful, like to lean on some of the resources that are also provided within an endocrinology clinic, but because they might also be able to provide like a dietitian also as well to help with supplementing the, the liver care. There are also some like amazing websites too, like from a cirrhosis perspective. So there's also cirrhosiscare.ca. Um, which is an amazing resource site. Like that's actually both for healthcare providers as well as for patients and caregivers. And that's actually translated to a number of different languages also as well. And actually encompasses a lot of different supports related to uh, diet and actually has like a pretty um, comprehensive nutritional guide that might be helpful to navigate. Um, and in relation to the addictions resources, like the ones I talked about, the Rapid Access Addiction Medicine Clinic, that is like a provincially funded resource. And I believe it's not just an Ontario specific initiative because I do hear RAM clinics being serviced all over like different areas of Canada also as well. Um, but in, and they were typically low barrier also too. So and the, the way they operate and the reason for the word rapid being in like the acronym is really about um, being able to have hours to facilitate walk-ins because it is meant for people who do want to be able to access addictions care rel relatively immediately. Um, and then so each of the RAM clinics may have different hours of service, but um, these would be things that would not necessarily be out of pocket, but would be publicly funded. Hopefully that's helpful. I may have gone about it in a comprehensive way, but um, hopefully that provides a little bit of an overview. Yeah. No, that, that really does. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin, do you have anything to add on your end, perhaps from your perspective, um, regarding some of these additional um, either services that uh, people with liver disease may either have to pay out of pocket or perhaps how to seek for them or whether that's something that's available um, through Blue Cross, whether it's addiction services or, or dietitian work or anything uh, related to folks living with chronic disease. Yeah, that's a great question. I think Liz mentioned there's a lot of online resources. I know that are available also within Alberta too. So that's one way in terms of personal health insurance. Um, we certainly have different wellness tools that are available through our benefit plans. For example, we have an individual assistance program where individuals can have various different counseling services available to them, um, whether that's a dietitian um, and beyond that too. Um, so there are different benefits that are included in these benefit plans that these different services that individuals may be looking for may be um, covered as they're on one of our benefit plans for sure. Perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll take uh, I'll just one more question here just for the purpose of time. I guess one of the general ones that we often get, maybe this one be more for you for Liz, um, would be some of the, the general challenges with, the, with navigating the system with respect to obtaining either blood work, um, receiving their results. And I think most importantly, more more commonly, I should say, actually seeing a family physician, depending on what province they're actually located in. There's, of course, some differences um, provincially with respect to actually um, having a general practitioner on hand or having sufficient specialists who deal in the liver field. Um, and it's usually those folks who actually reach out to us the most, the foundation, uh, the ones that actually don't have a general practitioner 
um, struggle to actually um, get obtain some necessary results or even screening if, if need be, uh, but also obtaining some referrals uh, to, to specialists, whether it's a liver specialist or even a potentially a transplant assessment. Um, so I guess generally speaking, uh, maybe your thoughts or, or kind of uh, some tips on on the folks who are tuning in or viewers who may be outside of some of the provinces who are more uh, perhaps structured that are dealing with some of these barriers to actually access uh, or take of care, whether it's uh, general practitioners, but also uh, the, the specialists and even the wait times. Oh, that is such a loaded like question. A... I know. <laughs> <laughs> That is such a loaded question. I, I mean, yeah, um, that, that is uh, definitely uh, a universal challenge and particularly people living in remote areas or in provinces with um, less providers um, or living in an area where it's very difficult to access primary care. Um, Man, I, I wish I had a good way of actually answering that question in a succinct way. And actually even having a good answer to it altogether. Um, and I, I think it comes down to, and maybe this is like a good reflection on maybe where to go like the next time around, like if I have an opportunity to do this again, like, you know, so it's, um, I, I think it, it's also really about um, making sure that even specific tests are being done in order to, if you have an interaction, like a one snapshot interaction with a provider, it's about, you know, knowing a little bit more and identifying, hey, you know, like I, I I was at a talk and I was told that, you know, I should have like a one-time screen of X, um, you know, and having that added to like the blood work per se. Um, and like, so to kind of really maximize like that one-time like snapshot. So, so that way, like, you know, like you do have a little bit more of a comprehensive workup and like in, in really kind of like, um, you know, I, I think that's may, maybe like where, yeah, that, that's like something I would think about a little bit more in the future is like really about more around the self-advocacy, like, it, and, you know, and being equipped with some knowledge around like, you know, I, I was told, you know, I have diabetes, like I've heard that diabetes is actually a risk factor for fatty liver, you know, and because like a lot of people actually are not being screened for liver disease when they do have metabolic comorbidities. And so, it often does not come hand to hand, um, you know, uh, and, and so I, I think it's about like perhaps like equipping with some language in order to really, you know, having like the, the like patients and um, being a little bit more aware, like, and so that way they can actually then ask like the tangible questions like that really get like providers really thinking a little bit more. And sometimes we have had patients that have come in to see us and a lot of it is related to the patients themselves having asked their providers to do X, Y, and Z, ironically. Um, so I, I don't know if that's like a good strategy, but um, but like I, I think that if, you know, in retrospect, like thinking about it, it probably would be about like um, how you would be armed with, um, you know, specific questions to really then have like a good more, um, targeted conversation. And I think even at the primary care level, like I had thought about from like a liver provider level, but now thinking about it even further upstream, it's like what you're asking, like what if you do have an interaction with the provider at all. So thanks for asking that. I, you know, I, I think that humbled me a little bit. So and it's a, it's 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 a challenging question. And I think it's just the unfortunate reality in some of these um, cases. And of course, there are individuals in, in metropolitan cities who do have access to various um, health services in a quicker fashion, for instance, who also experience their challenges and barriers, uh, regardless of, of, of location. But I find that's probably one of the more common inquiries that we get from our end uh, would be some of the, the base systemic issues that I think are relatively well known um, to some of these patients. And 
I think we always encourage as well to self-educate as much as possible and be your own health advocate as much as possible. So learning more about uh, liver health or liver disease as a whole uh, to at least help you prepare some questions subconsciously ahead of time uh, when you do happen to have that visit and um, to hope that you have some preparation um, leading up to it so that you're at least well versed in, 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 in the condition to some degree, uh, but also know kind of how to ask a question because it is a two way street uh, between the healthcare provider and the, and the patient as well. It's uh, expecting too much out of one individuals uh, tends to be a bit tricky and people often come back frustrated, I find. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it causes some uh, type of frustration and um, it's it's easy to blame, I find, the system, the healthcare system, because it's, uh, it's kind of point blank. Um, but then you kind of have to look back and see, well, what can you do as an individual, as a patient, for instance, um, to at least help yourself or what can your caregivers, your family members do to help themselves? Um, and that will essentially help the other side of the equation as well with health provider to provide you more insight. So some of the practical tips list you're mentioning earlier, but even the, having to bring the medications uh, to the to your uh, to your healthcare provider, the actual um, container itself is a I think it's a huge um, helpful tip because I don't think people will generally think of that. They would just say that they consume this or use this uh, without actually perhaps showing uh, what the actual medication is. So yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. No, thank thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm going to think a bit harder about that question too like it because like it's so much about like the constraint of the system too because it is very much about an interaction with the provider and from the provider then dependent on the provider to facilitate the referral um so you know like uh but yeah like i i think um you know definitely knowledge on both ends and i i think as a liver provider continue to help supporting a lot of education also to primary care is a really important piece that I think is really important um, as part of like just general awareness and really making linkages and really like thinking more about like prevalence of, prevalence of liver disease. And so that way we can really think about things that we could do further upstream to prevent downstream outcomes for sure. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that. So um, we'll we'll end the Q and A and we'll go briefly into a uh, breakout room. Um, so the breakout room, you'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you will see a button that says breakout rooms, and you can just click that button and give it a few seconds before you see some of the or the two different groups. Um, for the sake of this talk, we are splitting the groups into a um, Eastern and Western tennis. So we're going to have a Eastern Canada and Western Canada. So Ontario all the way to the Atlantic provinces will have uh, joined the Eastern group. And then uh, Manitoba towards the West will join the Western group. Um, so choose which group uh, best fits your geographical location. We'll do about a 10 minute discussion. Um, if we have a few members in one group and more in the other, we'll probably just join everybody together uh, for a peer to peer. So this can be a time where we can ask uh, both Liz and Caitlin, if they're able to stick around for about 10 minutes or so, um, some questions as well. And uh, myself and some of the staff members are also going to be able to ask um, some simple questions. So you'll see the screen. Um, so if you're uh, able to join, please choose a group and uh, give it a few seconds. And then uh, we'll be uh, there for about 10 minutes and then we'll join uh, the main meeting afterwards. Yeah. Uh, a great discussion there. We did go quite over there. I think we all got pretty passionate about that topic um, earlier. Um, so again, I do want to thank everyone for uh, attending, uh, the viewers, uh, but also um, individuals who, of course, have joined uh, during this meeting, but also those who are, who have, are watching this afterwards. Um, so that concludes our Living with Liver Disease program, actually, for 2022. Uh, we're going to have more program sessions available in 2023. Uh, so keep an eye out on our social media channels and, of course, our Living with Liver Disease webpage. And that's the liver.ca slash LWLD page. Um, so should you have any additional questions or comments or some people want to uh, stay up to date on everything liver health related, please connect with us via our social media channels um, highlighted on the screen there. Um, or simply send us an email at uh, clf at liver.ca. Uh, um, and finally, I just want to thank our sponsors uh, and, of course, a big thank you. Uh, for all those who attended tonight's sessions, uh, as well as Liz and, and Caitlin uh, for their great talks. Uh, so everyone have a great evening, and it's probably safe to say have a safe and happy holidays because it is uh, almost mid-December mid time frame. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and until next time.